Well, we're about a minute past getting started, so let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and we'll jump right in. Heavenly Father, we come humbly bowed before you. We thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for the opportunities that we've had uh, in this day to, to excel, to show forth your word, to be salt, to be light, to, to, to embrace this life and to truly find joy in, in each and everything that we do. Heavenly Father, we know that uh, often days are filled with frustrations and and setbacks and uh, shortcomings and uh, rather than focus on those things let us focus upon your word your your help in, in our time of need your your moving us forward in growth and uh, we thank you for this opportunity tonight to to come here and to open your word and to set those cares and concerns of the world aside and and dig in for just a, a few moments uh, to to your wonderful truths that you've provided uh, for our lifting up uh, for our encouragement uh, and for our strengthening. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these uh, uh, believers that gather here, those who have devoted themselves uh, to you with uh, a wholeness of heart, and we ask that you, you bless them and, and keep them, and, and uh, bless us as a family as we grow together and, and move forward. Heavenly Father, we, we pray for our leaders uh, and uh, that, uh, that they might have the wisdom to, to help each and every one of us to fulfill our ministry. Uh, and to do those things that you have set on our plates. Heavenly Father, be with those of our number that are sick, those who are, who are suffering from illness or, or struggles of uh, uh, some nature. Give them strength and courage and give us an opportunity to minister to them. Heavenly Father, all these things we pray in your Son's most holy name. Amen. All right. Uh, if you haven't done so already, the uh, handouts for tonight, I actually got here a little early. Uh, they're on the table in the foyer. Um, and tonight is uh, Song of Solomon, uh, Song of Solomon, uh, and uh, we're going to be going through it. I, I actually thought about combining this with another uh, one of the books, but I couldn't figure out which one to combine it with, so we're going to do it as a standalone thing. Um, it, it's just near impossible for us to get real deep into this book. Um, it's a wonderful piece uh, of poetry. Um, it's one of those pieces of poetry that uh, has been misinterpreted, interpreted, reinterpreted, and uh, kind of twist and turned in, in a number of different ways throughout, um, you know, the centuries. Uh, so we're going to look at just a little bit of that, um, but we're going to look at just some of the basics uh, of the Song of Solomon and try to just come to a simple understanding uh, of what uh, this book is all about. Um, so the uh, book of Song of Solomon uh, essentially is a book uh, about love. Uh, you, you can't go very far into the book of uh, Song of Solomon uh, without realizing uh, that uh, this, this is, you know, no matter what interpretation you make uh, of the book as a whole, um, no matter what uh, interpretation scheme you take, most people will acknowledge that uh, it, it is a book about love. Uh, and uh, love is uh, the, the core of it. Now, that love or the type of love is, is going to change somewhat uh, based upon the interpretation that you give it. Uh, most people will acknowledge that not only is it about love, uh, but that the, that the book is written uh, by Solomon. Uh, or in the very least, uh, it is a collection of poems uh, that was compiled by or written by Solomon and compiled by other people and simply put uh, together. But most people, um, most people will assert very clearly that you know, Solomon is the author uh, of the book. Uh, if you go back to the book of Song of Solomon, sometimes called the, the Song of Songs, uh, and when people call it that, uh, all they really mean is just the song above other songs. Uh, it's, it is the song most exquisite, uh, is what they mean. But that title is not given to it in the book. Um, neither is Song of Solomon, for that matter. Uh, it's just simply the title that's been applied to it after uh, the fact. But if you go to chapter 1, uh, in verse 1, uh, the opening verse says, Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Um, you really don't get much clearer than that, do you? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but, you know, people, people do kind of debate authorship. But there are people who will debate authorship, you know, no matter what. Uh, we saw that in Ecclesiastes. I mean, Ecclesiastes is clearly a description uh, of Solomon as king uh, over Israel, the wisest of all uh, that were before him and that would come after him. You know, it was clearly Solomon, and yet the book is hotly debated as far as authorship goes. 
Um, not so many people debate Sol uh, Solomon. Now, character of the book is primarily um, a poem. Uh, it is written, therefore, in that kind of Hebrew uh, poetry. So it's not uh, a poetry that, you know, is going to be written in your typical Shakespearean sonnet form. Uh, nor is it going to be written in too many of the other, you know, classical forms that you may have learned about if you ever had a poetry class um, that we would know and understand uh, that kind of end with rhyming words uh, and uh, sort of have create a nice little melody. Uh, that's really not Hebrew poetry. Uh, Hebrew poetry is set up uh, in, a, in a particular way uh, to emphasize the, thoin, the, the, thoin, the thought or the point uh, of uh, the, the text. So it's not so much on the form, uh, it's really more about the function. Uh, what, is they what are they trying to say? That's kind of the nature of Hebrew uh, poetry. So this is a Hebrew poem. Um, there are eight chapters and 117 um, verses. Song of Solomon, however, is one of the most hotly debated books uh, of the Bible as far as meaning uh, and theme uh, are concerned. Uh, it's just one of those, those books. And if you read through the book, uh, you can pre pretty much figure it out fairly quickly. Uh, I mean, have you, ever, has anybody, have you ever had a poetry class? Liked poetry and read poetry? You know, read maybe a famous poem and shared with somebody, oh, I thought, it, I think it means this. And they tell you, no, it doesn't mean that. It's all about this. Uh, you know, well, get the same thing kind of going on here. It's a poem. And as a poem, it, it is subject to, you know, interpretation. There is figurative language. Uh, and there are at least four different ways uh, that people have interpreted this book. Uh, so what I, what I want to do is just kind of summarize the ways, because you're going to run across some of these. We run, we, we, we run across one of them all the time. We just don't even realize that we do. Um, you, you ever, well, maybe I do. We might have even sang it Sunday, the song that talks about the lily of the valley. And in the song, as we sing it, the lily of the valley is clearly Christ, right? Um, well, that comes from one of the interpretation schemes uh, of the Book of Song of Solomon. Because that phrase, the lily of the valley, uh, is actually from uh, the Book of Song uh, of Solomon. Uh, and we'll read that verse uh, here in just uh, a little bit. Uh, but uh, why do we equate that to Christ? Well, that's one of the ways in which the book is interpreted. Uh, but there are four different ways, and we're just going to run through them kind of very quickly. Uh, not really dwell on uh, either any of them, you know, uh, to any great extent, uh, and then kind of give our evaluation of uh, what, <clears throat> what we think the correct interpretation is uh, and why um, we think that's the correct uh, interpretation. All right? So the first one is uh, the allegorical uh, interpretation. This is the one from which we get the whole lily of the valley is Jesus Christ uh, type of thing. Because in the allegorical view, uh, the whole book of Song of Solomon... Uh, is a kind of metaphorical or allegorical uh, depiction uh, of the relationship that God has, number one, with his people, Israel, uh, but then secondarily, um, the relationship that exists between Christ uh, and the church. In the poem, it's very clear that we're talking about a husband, or, you know, <clears throat> a, a man wooing a woman who then becomes his wife, and they are just madly in love. I mean, you can just tell by the descriptions that they give of one another uh, that they're just a couple that's madly in love. Uh, and essentially, the allegorical view um, is making the assertion that, you know, just like God loves us so much uh, to do all these wonderful things, you know, for us throughout history, and then even to the sending of his son uh, to die upon a cross, we ought to have that deep, rich, passionate love, you know, for God, uh, for God uh, in, in that relationship. And, and that's all true. I mean, that, that's true. Uh, Paul brings that out in the book of Ephesians, right? You know, where he talks about husbands love your wives. You, you know, wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives. And then he goes on to compare how, you know, Christ loved the church and how husbands ought to love their wives like Christ loved the church. So we have that comparison uh, but just because Paul wrote about it doesn't necessarily mean that's what Song of Solomon is about. 
Um, so that's one view. It's just kind of a story that's being told that is meant as a depiction of God's relationship with his people in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is the literal view. Uh, and there's not much of a description there because, well, it is what it is. Uh, it's just literally history and nothing more. Nothing more. Um, and we will go ahead and, I'm just going to go ahead and say this. If you read the book, I mean, you don't get two lines in and realize this is not simple history. I mean, let, here, I'll just, let me read a few lines from the opening chapter. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with kisses on his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. Others say, uh, we will exalt and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. She says, I am very dark, but lovely. O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Does that sound like literal history? No, it doesn't read like literal history. Uh, now, granted, no doubt there's a his history here, right? Just like a lot of poems have. Uh, anybody ever read the poem? Uh, it's one of my favorites, uh, The Charge of the Light Brigade. Nobody? Really? Lois, you've read that, right? You have? Okay. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's, it's founded in history, but it's very, it's very dramatic and it's very... You know, uh, the, the lines are meant to sound like charging horses, and uh, it, it's just, uh, it's a very good poem. Um, and it's meant to produce in you this emotion. Uh, and um, was it really like that, you know? Sometimes we get the impression that, and it's funny, we were talking the other, uh, the other night, me and the kids, um, right before bed, uh, and uh, I think it was Josh, said, you know, what, what if, maybe it was Bethany, you'll remember. You know, what if, what if your everyday life had a soundtrack? You know, because I mean, you know, you go to movies and it's got a soundtrack and, you know, something bad's going to happen. So, you know, dun, 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 you know sort of, so we thought, you know, what would your daily life sound like on soundtrack? You, you know, so we started talking a little bit about that, uh, you know, but I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, it, there's a history there, uh, but this is kind of that, you know, soundtrack uh, that's built uh, upon it. But it's not just simple history. So I think we can probably dismiss that one sort of out of pocket, right? Uh, the next view is the dramatic view. Okay, the dramatic view views the book uh, as the story of a country maiden who is taken from her home uh, and her shepherd, uh, you know, lover. Uh, to be one of the many wives of King Solomon, there's the history. Uh, the Shulamite maiden uh, resists her efforts, resists the every effort of Solomon, uh, and despite the glamour and the glitz and all of the the glory that is Solomon and his palace and temples, she refuses him uh, and is able to go back to her, go back to her, you know, simple country life with the simple man who just simply loves her, uh, and that's kind of the way that the story is presented. Uh, so it's just sort of written as a piece of um, almost like a, just a dramatic work of fiction uh, that is based in a historical context. Uh, and the whole point uh, that most of them will tell you uh, is that, you know, there's a condemnation of uh, polygamy, you know, the multiplicity of wives of Solomon and the concubines. Um, of course, the problem with that uh, is that Solomon's the writer. You know, he's the one that's writing this. Now, we don't know when he wrote it, but it's kind of hard to believe that, that Solomon is going to confess his fault in this way you know I mean if he, if he did regret having all the wives and all the concubines um, don't you think there'd be a better way to admit that confess it and make it right than to write some poem about some young girl who resists his advances uh, and goes back and is faithful that really doesn't tell Solomon's story uh, so you know it's kind of a far-fetched idea um, simply based on you know, the historical context and who uh, the author is supposed to be. Uh, but there are elements of, of the dramatic uh, view here uh, that I do think are important, uh, are important, um, which takes us to the next view. The next view is called, uh, and these are just, basically you could call it the moral uh, view. 
Uh, and it basically sees uh, the whole thing uh, as a uh, song that represents the purity uh, of true love, uh, the sacredness of love uh, and the marriage relationship as it is ordained by God between a husband uh, and a wife. In, in other words, this is a poem that is supposed to depict what the marital union is supposed to be like. You know, what it's supposed to look like when you are, you know, wed to one another. Um, you know, now th there are a lot of different arguments for each one uh, of uh, the, the positions. I don't want to go through them all. Uh, some of them are just quite lengthy and tedious and argue from, you know, figures of speech and things of that nature. To boil it all down, uh, I think we can eliminate some of these fairly quickly. Uh, for instance, the literal view. Um, and, oh, we skipped right over the literary view. Um, anyhow, li go back up for a second. Literary view, I guess there were five. Uh, views the book as a collection of love songs of Solomon. In, in other words, uh, each chapter is its own love song, uh, and they're really not connected at all. Um, well, you know, the book is kind of difficult to read at points because you don't necessarily know who's talking. Um, and that's one of the keys to interpreting the book. You have to first figure out who's talking because there's three basic players here. Uh, one, there is the girl. Two, there is the boy. Uh, but then there is this audience. Uh, call them the community. You know, uh, they sometimes speak too. Uh, for instance, if you go back to the text that I just read for you, um, the girl says, let him kiss me with kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. But then when you get down to verse 4, it's someone else talking all together. Uh, and you know that because it says, we will exalt and rejoice in you. Uh, so, you know, the pronouns uh, kind of reveal here that we've switched characters. Uh, so, um, <laughs> if you're going to read the song, uh, you know, accurately and correctly, you have to literally follow the pronouns. Uh, and you have to figure out who's saying what. Because it's real easy uh, to kind of get mixed up. Um, but it, think of it as a play. You, you know, you, you ever read a manuscript, a play? You, you know, well, the character. It'll say character. And then it'll sometimes give a little note, you know, in a sarcastic tone. And then it'll give the line. Um, well, you have to kind of look at that, look at this like that. Cer certain versions have it that way. Uh, for instance, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's all English Standard versions, um, but uh, I know most of the electronic uh, or the E versions for the English Standard version, they insert that for you. Uh, it'll say, you know, she, him, other is typically what it does. Uh, so that becomes very, very important, um, but you have to know how to do that. So anyhow, the literary views, the literary view just sees it as a collection Again, while it's admittedly difficult to read, it's obvious that from chapter 1 all the way to the final chapter, we're talking about the same people. Uh, and we're having the same conversation. I mean, the book pretty much ends the way it begins. Um, with just this madly, deeply, truly in love sort of thing uh, between these two people. Okay, so uh, it's not a collection. Uh, and if it is a collection, I'd like to find the person who can show me where the break is. Uh, for all of the different things. Most people who tell you it's just a collection of poems won't be able to tell you where the break is for the individual poems. Um, and if they do, it creates a kind of disconnectedness uh, in, the psalm as a, or in the song as a whole. Uh, but anyhow, there are a couple of things that we can observe about some of the interpretations. Uh, for instance, uh, if it is an allegory, um, it is an allegory that takes what Paul says uh, and just magnifies it uh, to the nth degree. And now, Paul in Ephesians talks about, you know, husbands loving their wives, uh, like Christ loved the church. But he kind of leaves it there, right? He kind of leaves it there. You, know, you ought to have that closeness. You ought to have that bond. Um, what the Bible never does, um, except for maybe in the book of Ezekiel in a negative sense, uh, is get into this language that is very, uh, how do you want to put it, sexually charged. Uh, I mean, for instance, I mean, if you go, if, if you go on, uh, if you go on and you read 
uh, in the book, beginning, let's say, verse 8. Uh, if you, <clears throat> this is the guy talking. If you do not know, O most, uh, o most beautiful among women, follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your, goat, pasture your young goats beside the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings uh, of jewel. And the others say, we will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver. While the king, I'm in the wrong chapter. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah, down 13, that's, what, that's the one I'm looking for. Um, yeah, beginning with 12. While the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyard of Engedi. Behold, you are lovely, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Truly a delight. Our couch is green. The beams of our house are cedar. Our rafters are are pine. Uh, And I went through and I I counted um, several different places where uh, there are just, hold on, let me see if I can find another one. There are just descriptions. They are describing one another. And, and they're describing one another in terms that would only be fitting the husband-wife relationship. Uh, you know, uh, for... It's best if I just read them. Um, hold on a second. I had them all marked. Yeah, okay, here we go. Um, Song of Solomon, uh, verse, chapter 4, verse 5. Uh, Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of gazelles that graze among the lilies. Until the day breeze and the shadow flees, I will go away to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. Uh, and then he goes on in uh, chapter, uh, chapter 7 uh, and verse uh, 8. I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. Oh, may your breasts be like clusters on the vine and the scent of your breath like apples. Now, what is he describing there? You know, he's describing a closeness. Them coming together in a very intimate, you know, sexual way. And while the Bible does use similar terms, you know, we are to know God and to have that intimate relationship... It never uses language that is sexually charged, like this language, to describe the relationship of the Christian with Christ. Uh, So, while the allegory on the surface seems to be something that we can borrow from Paul and apply to Song of Solomon and and a lot of other places. I mean, you know, you go to the prophets... um, and there are a number of prophets who, who will come to God's people and they will say, you know, you're a wicked and adulterous, you know, generation. Um, well, you know, adulterous is a, a sexually charged word, too. Um, but it's also a word that just simply means unfaithful. Um, so, you know, that's about as harsh as it gets until you get to Ezekiel. Uh, and then Ezekiel does have some of that type of, you know, language. You, you know, you have, you know, lusted after the, 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 the stallions of the foreign nations and you have r- lifted your skirts to them. And, you know, he uses language like that, but it's all kind of negative. Uh, never, never kind of a positive thing. And it's meant to be repulsive uh, in those contexts. Um, but as far as, you know, the relationship we have with God, I don't know. I just tend to think that this is just kind of pushing the allegory too far. You know, it's kind of like what some people do with parables. Uh, I mean, parables are, you know, um, earthly stories with heavenly meaning. And most parables have only one point. You know, there's, there's one point to a parable. You know, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then you can probably insert one word or one sentence uh, in order to, you know, figure that whole thing out. You know, but um, there are folks who kind of make more hay out of parables than they should. You know, for instance, uh, you know, we have the parable of, you know, the, uh, uh, the mustard seed. You know, you put, the, you put a mustard seed in the ground, it grows to a great tree, uh, so that uh, it's so big that the birds can come and sit on the branches. Uh, I once had a person tell me that, well, that parable was teaching 
uh, that eventually, you know, Christ expected his church to, to be, you know, denominational. I'm like, where do you get that? Well, the denominations are the different birds that are sitting on the mustard tree. And I'm like, it's kind of missing the point. I mean, that wasn't his point at all. You know, you're making more out of it than it actually is. Uh, and I think that the allegory for Song of Solomon kind of does that. Uh, and I, I don't know. It seems almost distasteful uh, to, to take the imagery of Song of Solomon as intimate as it is and as sexual as it is uh, and apply it to that relationship. You know, not that there's anything wrong with that, um, but we're not really taught that in any other place in the Bible. Does that make sense at all? Yeah? Okay. I mean, <laughs> just, I don't know. It's always, the allegory thing has always hit me funny, and that's why when we sing that Lily of the Valley song, it just kind of, I don't know, it always makes me, but it's a good song. It's a good song. Um, but uh, anyhow. Uh, the author, uh, skip down to the last point under the <clears throat> that section, it says the author sees the book as a dramatic presentation um, designed to describe uh, and detail the proper sexual relationship between a husband uh, and a wife. So uh, the view that I would take is, is that it is kind of a drama, but it's a drama that's designed uh, to push the point of this is what it looks like uh, to be in a proper um, marital relationship. And I think that's kind of uh, the point. And that kind of lines up a little better uh, with what, y you know, uh, if um, it comes up, kind of lines up a little better with, uh, I, I believe, the history and uh, some of the things that are talked about within uh, the book. All right. Um, yeah, let's go on to key verse and key chapter. Anybody have anything to add about that? Anybody, you have a particular view? I mean, what, what have you always learned about the Song of Solomon? That it was just a book about love? Just a love story? Hmm? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's just, yeah, I agree. But, um, all right, key chapter, key verse. Uh, chapter one, uh, I mean... Again, this, these are things that are debatable, whatever chapter you like. Joyce, did you have something? Oh, I was just going to look at the opposite side of the coin, so to speak, though. When he spoke of Jerusalem and her unfaithfulness to him, and he referred to her as being a harlot, you know, playing. True. You know, so, I mean, it can go both ways as far as I'm concerned. You know, the, the beauty of it and then the, the ugliness of, the, of Jerusalem, you know. So. Yeah, I, I mean... It's just nowhere else in the Bible does he use this language to describe that positive side of that loving relationship. When it comes to that aspect of it, you know, he'll talk about knowing him. He'll talk about being faithful to him. He'll talk about, you, you know, um, loving, you know, the church like, or loving your wife like Christ loved the church. But that's about as far as it goes. Uh, and again, I mean, it's just, do I have any kind of, do I have any kind of, uh, you know, hard rock type evidence to say that it's not an allegory? No, I mean, but we don't need it to be an allegory for those things to be taught in the scripture. I mean, they're definitely taught. We need to have an intimacy with God and we need to perceive it as us being bonded to him. But to me, Song of Solomon is very clearly not just about love. It's about an erotic type of love. Now, when I say that, I don't mean a perverse erotic type of love. I mean eros, the Greek word, describing that sexual relationship that exists based on the rest of the context of the Bible uh, between a husband and a wife. Um, it's, I mean, there's just too much there. Talk about, you know, coming to the garden, uh, spreading, you know, the, the perfumes and the, the this and, you know, uh, come into my couch. And I mean, it's just, it, it's all just very, very, you know, sexually charged and, and, you know, but I mean, 
you know, like Joy said, I mean, we don't need it to be an allegory for those things to be taught. Um, but you are right. You know, the, we do have some of that language uh, throughout uh, the rest of Scripture. Uh, as far as the key chapter goes, uh, I just chose chapter 1 because it just kind of sets the tone. Uh, sets the tone for the rest of the book. Uh, and what you're going to find is that uh, it pretty much carries through. Uh, there's this, this uh, established, uh, deepened sense of love. Uh, we established there's a him, there's a her, there's a community. Uh, all three of them are talking. Uh, sometimes the community seems to support them. Sometimes the community seems to be against them. Uh, but, um, it, you know, uh, chapter one just kind of sets uh, the, the precedent uh, and uh, lets us know, you know, where we are as far as uh, this relationship. And then from there, it just kind of progresses. Uh, in kind of a natural, you know, way, uh, a natural way. Uh, we go from, you know, kind of their introduction. Uh, by the time we get to the end of chapter 3, there's a description of a wedding feast. Uh, and then, of course, as we go through uh, the rest of the chapters, it's just kind of a description of the continuation of their love, seemingly after marriage. Uh, so, you know, chapter 1 is as good as any to kind of set the scene and stage for us. Um, personally thought chapter 7 and verse 10 um, was kind of a verse that in the shortest way possible gave us a description of the book. Um, it just simply says, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. Uh, his desire is for me. Okay. So I thought that was uh, just kind of a fitting description. Um, as far as key phrases and key words, the word beloved uh, is used, and again, some of this depends upon uh, what version of the Bible you're using, uh, but about the average, uh, it's uh, 23 times. Uh, so there are about 23 times that the word beloved is used, uh, and it's usually <clears throat> either she speaking to him or he speaking, you know, to her, um, going kind of back and forth. They're both calling each other, you know, beloved. Um, second unto it is the phrase, um, my beloved, or my beloved is mine, or I am his, or she is mine, you know, something like that. Kind of the, uh, uh, how you want to put it, uh, sort of the, you know, ancient version of Valentine's Day, you know, uh, something that you would put on one of those little candy hearts, be mine, or uh, I am his, or she is mine, or, you know, something like that. Those phrases kind of recur all throughout, uh, all throughout uh, the book. Um, probably the most memorable one, uh, is uh, from chapter 2. If I can get back there. Chapter 2. And... Yeah, verse uh, 16. It says, My beloved is mine and I am his. He grazes among the lilies. Until the day breeze and the shadow flees, turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle in a young stag on cleft, uh, you know, mountains. So... Um, you see it there. You saw it in chapter 7 where we just read uh, a few moments ago. Uh, he is, my beloved is mine and I am his. Okay, so re it repeats as well. Uh, there's a cast of characters. Just to kind of go through them. Um, we, we know that, we, we know that uh, um, one of the characters is, is a woman. We know that one of the characters uh, is uh, a uh, man. We seemingly know uh, that the girl uh, is apparently a hard-working, you know, shepherd girl. Uh, if you go back to chapter 1, <clears throat> chapter 1, it says, do not, gr do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were very angry with me. They, they made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard uh, I have not kept. Um, you know, again, is that a metaphor? Yeah, it could very well be. Uh, but she does describe herself as uh, dark. She does describe herself as having to work out in the sun. Uh, having to work out in the sun. So apparently she is either a shepherd or she's tending the vineyard or something of nature. I think in the notes I put shepherd. Um, then we have the bridegroom. Uh, the bridegroom is uh, apparently a handsome uh, and stately you know, shepherd. Uh, uh, and uh, he, uh, you know, well... Some people say it's Solomon. Some people would say it's just Solomon writing uh, about this character. Um, you know, it's subject to debate. Um, quite frankly, I, I think it's Solomon. 
uh, I think it's Solomon, uh, and uh, I, it's, to me, you, you get to chapter 3, <clears throat> and um, beginning in verse 6, he says, What is coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the fragrant, wonder, or, or fragrant powders of a merchant? Behold, it is the litter of Solomon. Around it are sixty men, some of the mighty men of Israel, all of them wearing swords and expert in war, each with his sword uh, at his thigh against terror by night. King Solomon made himself a carriage from the wood of Lebanon. He made, it posts, uh, made its posts of silver, its back of gold, its seat of purple, its interior was inlaid with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go out, O daughters of Zion, and look upon King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. Uh, so it sounds like uh, it is a parade for Solomon on the day that he got married. Um, so is it Solomon? I don't know. Based upon that context, it seems to be Solomon. It seems to be Solomon. Uh, so we have this girl who, as far as we know, is unnamed. Um, some people would refer to her as a Shulamite. Uh, some people just call her the shepherd girl. Uh, some folks just say she's the bride. Um, but um, we don't really know uh, a whole ton about her. Um, we do know that uh, I believe uh, the, the bridegroom is, you know, Solomon. Uh, and then we do know that there is this chorus uh, that is there, which, which would not have been uncommon uh, for theatrical productions. I mean, if, if you ever read Shakespeare, you know, if you read Shakespeare, Shakespeare has that in it. You know, there are choruses, uh, you, you know, and it's not people singing. It's just them speaking all together in this one, you know, voice, uh, saying certain things. Um, so, you know, it seems kind of like this is what, you know, the same as that. Uh, so these people are speaking in unison, most of the time celebrating uh, the bride and the bridegroom's love uh, and their union. All right, basic outline of the book. Um, if you've read through the book, you, you can see how it would be very difficult to kind of outline, um, it, at least beyond kind of a, a generic sense. Uh, but I think there are at least uh, three divisions that we can find in the book. Now, and I've seen presentations of this, and, and very good presentations um, of, of this. Um, I can't remember. Glenn had the DVD set at one time. Uh, but uh, they, they talk about it uh, as um, kind of a progression uh, in the relationship, starting off with, you know, well, guy first sees the girl and, you know, he's interested and they, you know, uh, they, they date one another and what that's supposed to look like and, um, and then they, you know, are engaged and what that's supposed to look like and then they get married and what that's supposed to look like and then after marriage and what that's supposed to look like. And I've seen people break it down that way. Uh, and they've given great uh, presentations uh, that bring in a lot of Bible um, about those particular things. And I think it's all right. I, I just don't know that all of that's in Song of Solomon. Um, but um, anyhow, there's at least, I think, three different uh, kind of breaks uh, that we can point out. Uh, first of all, I think there is the preparation for the wedding. Uh, that's chapters 1 through 3, uh, which culminates, uh, you know, builds up to what the verses that we just read, uh, which is the actual wedding itself. Uh, so section 1 is kind of, you know, pre-wedding uh, and then into the wedding. Then uh, the uh, ch second one is the couple's uh, profession of love uh, and uh, desire. Uh, chapters 4, chapters 5, you have uh, she uh, or excuse me, him, him presenting his, you know, love to her and, and uh, uh, he presenting his, or, or she presenting uh, her love to him and the longing for him. Uh, and then the final, you know, three chapters are just kind of them both united in love. And again, I know that's very, very generic, uh, but um, that, that's about all we have. Are we done? That was two? Okay, wow. I didn't know if we were, how far we were going to get. Uh, but you can read through the summary here. This is not my summary. You'll notice it down at the bottom. Uh, it's a summary by, summary by a guy by the name of Jeffrey Krantz. Um, he gives a pretty good presentation of uh, Song of Solomon. Um, <clears throat> actually, he and his wife uh, have written about it, uh, and they have uh, some you know, pretty good series of lessons. But this is kind of his estimation, uh, his estimation of what the book of Song of Solomon is uh, all about. Uh, so you can read through the rest of that. Uh, and again, like we like to always do, I just encourage you to read the book. 
Uh, I think uh, I read it uh, all the way through in about 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, it's, it seems like, I mean, I know it's got, you know, eight chapters, but they're not big chapters. They're pretty small. Surely. Well, I, I'm telling you, I mean, there, there are sections of it where you're reading along, and, and especially if you're reading it out loud, it'll kind of make you blush a little, because you're thinking, and you know, I mean, you, you know, you don't know exactly what he's saying, but you know what he's saying, right? You, you know, it's that kind of context, uh, and it's pretty clear uh, that it's, you know, he's not just talking about, you know, agape type of love. He's talking about something you know, more uh, than that. So, yeah, you know, Ezekiel's that way too. Uh, and I know I've said that several times. And, you know, when we get there, we'll kind of go over some of that. Man, too bad Ezekiel's not your week. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, uh, Ezekiel's that way too. Uh, Ezekiel gets pretty, pretty racy with some of this stuff. But, yeah, good observation. All right. Appreciate everybody's comments. If you would, you can turn in your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. In just a minute, I want to start reading in verse uh, 1, and we're going to go down through about verse uh, 7. <clears throat> While you're turning there, just to kind of tell you a little, just a little story, uh, something that happened to me the last uh, week or so. Uh, a little girl that goes to the school uh, where, where I teach sometimes, uh, and uh, she approached me one day, uh, knowing that uh, I'm one of the you know, basic math teachers there, uh, and she said, Mr. Benish, can you teach me? And she named the thing that she wanted me to teach her. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we took her side and, and showed her on the board and let her practice it and go through it and correct her. And then she practiced again. And by the time we were done, maybe 15, 20 minutes, she knew and she understood the concept. Uh, and she was walking away. I and mean, she turned back to me and she looked at me and she said, you know, Mr. Benish, that number four, that we had in that last problem, you know it's the only number that has the same letters in it as the number. And I looked at her and I said, I never realized that. Four is the only number that has the same number of letters as the number. And I thought and I thought and I thought and I thought, trying to think of a number that would fit that bill. And I couldn't come up with one. And I thought, well, it sounds pretty good. And it kind of made me think of the lesson for tonight. And it kind of made me think of this particular context. When I was in preaching school, one of the things that <clears throat> our teachers would emphasize to us over and over and over was the need, and, and I'll use one of the teacher's words, was the need to always be teachable. The need to always be teachable. And when I first heard that, I thought, well, isn't everybody teachable? You know, but then as I started to teach people, I began to realize that it's very easy to become unteachable. And the basic idea is very simply this, that we can reach a point to where we are just simply unwilling to accept things that are new, right or wrong. We're just simply unwilling to even check them out because they're different than what we've heard in the past. And yet, at the same time, when it comes to spiritual things, if we walk away from the Bible with nothing else, certainly we have to be convinced that Christianity, this, this walk of life that we have, is progressive in nature. You know, Paul talked about it in, in the book of Corinthians. We talked about planting seed, watering seed, giving the increase. When he talked about them, you know, you were once like this, but now you're this way. And yet we can read from the book that the Corinthians were far from perfect. They had become Christians, and yet still a lot of imperfection there. When we talk about being teachable, we're talking about our ability, our desire, our willingness, our wanting to grow. So no matter where we are in life, we've always got to have this attitude that we are teachable. We've always got to have this attitude that, you know what, there's something more for me to learn. You know, the old saying is true. You should learn something every day. It's true. 
You should learn something every day. Paul, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, is kind of in this discussion about the last days. And he's describing how these last days are going to be godless days. And I want you to notice a couple of things that he says. He says, but understand that, this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving God, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. And verse 7 is the one I want you to see. Always learning, never able to arrive at the knowledge of truth. Here's folks who always sit at the feet of learning, who are in the world every day and should be grasping the truth that is all around them, but they never give themselves to it. They never give themselves over to it. Just like so many Christians never give themselves over to the growth process. I think like Paul would write so many fellow Christians in his day and age. Sentiments that would basically sound like this. But we expect better of you. But our expectation is that you will not do these, or you will excel. And I think that's what God says about all of us. God is willing to give us the benefit of the doubt, just as he is willing to give us the teaching. But you see, at some point, we've got to take the reins and the responsibility and move forward, being teachable, open to God's word. Sometimes we talk about it in terms of balance. You know what biblical balance is? Biblical balance is doing... All of the will of God and only the will of God. That's the simplest definition of biblical balance I've ever heard. Now, it doesn't probably include all the ideas we need to include. But do we practice all of the will of God and only the will of God? Some of us kind of come up short. Maybe because of fear. Maybe because of pride. Maybe whatever the reason might be. But if we're teachable, if our hearts are open to him, and if he's knocking at the door and we say, come on in, then we're going to be ever ready to learn. Well, maybe you're here tonight and the lesson that you need to learn is that God has created a way back to you. Way back. Well, I never left, right? Maybe it's what you think. Well, sin is part of who we are and that all men sin and fall short of the glory of God. And when we sin, that's the thing that separates us from God. And when it separates us from God, the only way we get back is by God's road. By hearing his word and by believing, by repenting of our sins, confessing the name of Christ, being baptized for the remission of sins. Maybe you're here tonight and that's what you need to do. Step out of the owl and into the water and be born again. Maybe you just simply need to return. Maybe you're just struggling and you need prayers. Whether you say them there in your seat or whether you pull someone aside after and you huddle in the back corner somewhere and you just have that prayer together. <laughs> Don't leave here tonight without having your spiritual needs met. And let your brothers and sisters help you. That's why we're here, right? We're here to teach one another, but we're also here to teach one another to be teachable. If you're subject to the invitations call, come as we stand and sing.